evening, buenas noches. On behalf of Mitchell Kaplan and everyone at Books and Books in Coral Gables, I'd like to welcome you to tonight's virtual author event presented in collaboration with Miami Book Fair, Lit Hub, and Culture Crusaders. Tonight, we're celebrating a new book by Aspen Mattis. Your Blue is Not My Blue, a missing person memoir, is a poetic and probing inquiry into the nature of marriage and family, as well as a story of creative awakening. Aspen is also the author of the critically acclaimed memoir, Girl in the Woods. Her short form writing has appeared in the New York Times, The Atlantic, Salon, and Tin House, among others. She's based in New York, but got stuck in Portugal from where she is speaking with us tonight. Aspen is joined this evening by one of the top 100 heroes and icons of the century, Deepak Chopra, the founder of the Chopra Foundation. He is the author of over 89 books translated into over 43 languages. His 90th book, Metahuman, Unleashing Your Infinite Potential, unlocks the secrets to moving beyond our present limitations to access a field of infinite possibilities. This evening, we've tapped the wonderful Kelly Sullivan Walden to moderate what promises to be a fascinating discussion. Kelly is a certified clinical hypnotherapist, coach, consultant, inspirational speaker, workshop facilitator, and author. To start the program tonight, Aspen will read a little bit from her new book. Then we'll invite Deepak to read a little bit from his book, and then Kelly will come on the stage to moderate a conversation with both of them. Please share your questions with us by writing them in on the bottom of the screen where it says, ask a question. After the conversation, Kelly will pick a few of these for a short Q&A with our guests. I'll take a moment to remind you that you can order Aspen's new memoir by clicking the button on the screen below. All of Deepak and Kelly's various books are available on our website, www.booksandbooks.com. And now, without further ado, let's get started. Hang on. Welcome, Aspen. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> so at this point in the book, I've been married for three years to my husband, Justin, and he's just left to attend the untimely funeral of our friend, and I'm expecting him back um, that night. When I drift back from class at dusk, all haze has cleared. The leaves like red flames and the air sharp blue. Our vibrant turquoise walls are shadows in the dark. Walking the space like a ghost, all I need is a hug from my husband, but I do not find Justin. He must be stuck in traffic, I assume, still coasting south from the funeral I know I should have attended. I wait for him to return to the city, our apartment quiet. Yet by midnight, my husband still hasn't come home. Trying to suppress deep rising panic, I call him. His phone doesn't ring, but cuts directly to voicemail. Stunned, I sit in the silence that at last the end beep of the final automated message telling me his voicemail box is full and I send a frantic text. Eventually, darkness swallowing our room, I go to bed alone. But lying still, worried, I cannot sleep. Rising again restless, I undress in front of our black fifth story window. Buried away in my dresser is the garment I've kept pristine for three years, the mermaid bra I wore under my wedding dress, strapless and white. I put it on. I feel nervous and pretty, hooked in the fabric I'd married him wearing. That night, I sleep in it, my heart held tightly. Day two. I wake to a pale and glowing dawn, the off-white pie in my window too pallid, it appears almost snowing. 
but the first flakes of the coldest season have not yet fallen, and the bed remains empty beside me, still no Justin. I noticed his cherished belongings in the apartment, his grandfather's World War II wallet, a great treasure embossed in gold, and his iPad both remain on our bedside table. Wherever he, he is, he'd clearly planned to return. Am I supposed to read now? So instead of reading, I think I'm just going to speak a little bit because um, Aspen is a very eloquent uh, writer and storyteller. You just heard her. She's amazing. Uh, my book, Meta Human, is um, called Meta Human because uh, meta means beyond and human means beyond the human conditioned mind. If you look at human uh, history, Human beings have been on this planet for only 200,000 years. And written language is approximately five to 7,000 years uh, in evolutionary terms. So we've been writing stories only for 5,000 years. Oral language has existed for maybe 30, 40, 50,000 years. But one fact is for sure, uh, to be human, is to have a story. Um, we are the only species on this planet that tells stories. We have a past story, we have a present story, we have a future story, and we attempt in our lives to create a life uh, that has a love story in it. And that's what we were listening to when Aspen was reading. The raw material of experience, however, is just sensations, Perceptions like sound, touch, sight, taste, smell, color, shape, form, textures, and then how we interpret that as the mind and how we feel about that as the as 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 emotions. So if you look at any experience, it doesn't matter what the experience is, the experience is sensations, sense perceptions, images, feelings, thoughts. That's the vocabulary of experience. But humans take that raw material of experience and make a story out of it. So the first stories of humankind were all gossip. Who's sleeping with who? Who left whom? We just heard Aspen, a very eloquent human story, and you're waiting to see what happens next. Those are the earliest stories that evolved into mythology, ultimately religion and philosophy and theology and today science because science is also a story science is a particular story based on observation what we call empirical facts theories experiments validation and then um, uh, maybe sometimes falsification but uh, there's a methodology to science and then science constructs a story about reality so right now if you want to know what the story about reality is Actually, the traditional scientific story that we have been brought up with, not talking about mythology or religion or spirituality, but the traditional scientific story right now is in trouble because of two questions. One is, what is the universe made of? And the shortest answer, I don't have time to go into all this, is the universe is made of nothing. The second um, open question in science is, if the universe is made of nothing, then why does it look like this? Why does it look like what you're looking at right now? Colors, shapes, forms, sounds, textures, smells, ideas, thoughts, feelings, aspirations, imagination. This in science is called the hard problem of consciousness, which means we actually don't know how matter produces mind or consciousness or our ability to tell a story, how do atoms and molecules in the brain move about randomly uh, and cause the emission of electrochemical activity. How does that become the story of experience? No one knows. So universe is made of nothing. Consciousness, which is our mental activity, is also made of nothing. And then those two things, ultimately end up as everything, 
what we call stars and moon and sky and people and animals and bugs and bees and COVID-19 and the ecosystem of existence. This is where science is struggling. We cannot experience or explain what we call fundamental experience of reality by assuming that the world is physical. Therefore, my book says the world is not physical. The world is a perceptual activity conditioned by the human mind into a story that we call the universe, the body, and other people. When we question our stories and go to the source of all stories, what we find is pure consciousness, pure consciousness, which means consciousness without a story. And of course, the source of all stories. Consciousness has infinite possibilities, infinite creativity, self-regulation, evolving into stories that we call existence. Our existence is a story. And furthermore, it's a human story based on consciousness modulating itself as perceptions, sensations, images, feelings, and thoughts. Why try to figure this out? When we figure this out, we realize that every story is provisional, including Aspen's story. Every story is provisional. We do not have to be tethered to our stories. And once we embed ourselves in the story, we can enjoy it just like when you watch a movie or read a beautiful novel. You can embed yourself, but once in a while, remember to pinch yourself and tell yourself that you are projecting the story. You're the choreographer, the producer, the director, the hero, and the villain of the story. And for every story you have, there are infinite other versions and you are intrinsically free from all stories in the eastern wisdom traditions we call this freedom from karma so karma is the conditioned mind and creativity is the meta human mind that's it for today and i just wanted to summarize briefly what the thesis of my book is wow Hi, you guys. That was amazing. That was quite a wonderful summary, both of you. So welcome, everyone. And I'm I'm just a big fan of both of yours. Um, Aspen and I have become close over uh, the last couple of years, and I'm so inspired by your writing and so powerful and evocative, and it inspires me. And, and Deepak, may I call you Deepak? I know sure. that you're doctor and oh, it doesn't matter call me anything i that's I have, another story that's another story well one story of how i came to know you years ago my sister had an appendix burst and it was very whether she was going to be alive or not was very tenuous and um while she was recovering i came upon um time ageless ageless body time, ageless body mind, time, yeah. timeless mind yeah. And I played it over and over for her while she was recovering. And she and so she and I both fell in love with you. And and I've read most of your books, I have to say. <laughs> It'd be Thank you. Yeah. but I'm really loving, really loving MetaHuman. And and so I've been thinking about the interesting ways in which um this conversation is coming together at this time in history. This is such a special time in history where there's so much going on um, with COVID-19 that we've got two pandemics that we're in the midst of. And neither of your books address the pandemics directly, and yet they do. I, I feel that your both of your books, your blue is not my blue and MetaHuman, I'm holding them both up right here. I feel like they're both two sides of the same coin. They're the yin and the yang of, of solutions and I think that if people want solutions during this time, they should be reading both of your books um, because I feel like Aspen's book brings us the story version of what your book, MetaHuman, gives us the science behind. So it's, it's a powerful combination, a one-two punch, so to speak. So neither of you wrote your books with COVID-19 in mind or with, um, with George Floyd in mind. 
um, philosophically, Aspen, let's start with you. You, in your, in your book, you, your blue is not my blue. Let's mm -hmm. start there. This, the title, uh, I believe this is going to become a hashtag that people are going to use all the time, but let's hear your definition of what does this mean? Your blue is not my blue. Yeah, it's just born from the, the reality that there's no way to prove that any given two people see the color blue the identical way. And there's a lot of evidence that we all see the color blue differently. And so your blue is literally not the same blue that I see. And so you can apply that to really any situation. The story that I make up about that situation won't be identical to the story that you make up about it. And recognizing that both your your perception and my perception are um, our stories, our inventions, um, kind of, as Deepak was saying, takes us outside of and above the drama of the conflict um, and um, to a place of a higher perspective where we can see um, that a lot of the things that we feel are so real are in fact just stories. Right. How can we free? And I know without giving away what happens in your book, so I feel like I'm, because I'm such the, I always tell people the punchline, so I'm going to try so hard to not do that. But we know just from the back cover of the book that transformation happens here. There's there's a, there's a transformational story and, and it all hangs on your blue is not my blue. The ability to see that your story isn't the story and there's freedom in that. Um, do you feel that there's, do, how, how do you connect the dots between that awareness and what's going on in the world, let's say with the protests going on? I know even in Portugal where you are right now, um, how do you see that connecting? Yeah, I think that, I mean, the really the ultimate message that I hope people will take from your blue is not my blue is that any narrative in which you are the victim is a story that you've written. Um, and it's a disempowering story and it prevents, um, it literally blocks your power. Like it, it, it takes away your active like agency in that story. And the story that I was telling about my, my relationship with my husband in it, he disappeared and, you know, did this to me. And um, and so I, I came to see through a series of events that he had an entirely different story about what had happened. And I wasn't, as he was saying, the victim or the villain, but I was also the victim and the villain. I was every character. And, um, and I think it, it, what's happening in the world right now is people are waking up to their power, I think, and discovering that this, the the role that the roles that we've been cast in as a society are not like the way it has to be, and that's so empowering and that's so exciting and um, and the, and that discovery has has really caused the beginning of what I think will be a, a revolution and um, like a massive um, massive movement for equality and, and greater um, equity. And in respect of all people as having um, their own blues and valid, everyone's blue is just as valid as anyone else's blue. Mm, beautiful, beautiful. Were you going to say more? Oh, no, that's okay. okay. So Deepak, your blue is not my blue, even though I think your blue is probably just like my blue. <laughs> but it's that's it to me, having read Metahuman, it feels like a it's, it relates to what I'm getting from MetaHuman, the ability to think beyond the story I make up, the, the dream that I think is so, so real in this reality. It's kind of, it feels like, I feel like I'm a little nervous to say these things because I feel like it's such a heated time and people are like, what do you mean? This is real. And, and there is a reality to it, but there's an opportunity here and I don't want us to miss it. So how, 
from this, your blue is not my blue perspective, Deepak, what would you say to people that are, that are wanting to be free, but maybe clinging to a point of view? Well, you have to look at the facts of what is happening today uh, with, uh, with the racism particularly, but even with COVID-19, you can connect the two. So let's talk about the racism and the violence first, because that's the yeah. story. And yeah. that's the story of uh, 400 years or 500 years of colonial uh, devastation across the world. Uh, I'm a product of that. Um, you know, any colored person in the world today is a descendant of colonialism. You have to start there. Colonialism started 500 years ago. Those of us who are not white um, are descendants of the people that were conquered by colonialists uh, and raped and murdered and pillaged in the name of king, queen, or colonial empire, as they called it, empire. My great-grandfather was murdered by the British because he was a tribal chief and he didn't want to give up his land, so he was shot. Oh. And uh, that's part of my history. Wow. Um, if you look at the African Americans in the United States, they are the descendants of slaves and the colonialists went there to Africa. All Africans were the same. It's like saying all Europeans are the same. But if you're an African, you know the difference between a Somali and a Nigerian and a South African and somebody from Botswana or whatever. Yet to the Western conquerors, they were all black slaves. They were barbarians. Their religions were primitive, uh, which happened in India also. We were called heathens, and the entire civilization was neglected. The connection with nature, with the ecosystem, with the ways of thinking were all uh, neglected. And basically, the spirit of these people was broken. The spirit was broken. And that is genetically programmed right now in our body to create inflammation, mental illness, depression, and even violence, because there is a memory in our genes of that story, that story of exploitation, of rape, of pillage, of murder, of lack of self-esteem because the spirit was broken. Now, while I see this wonderful, you know, all the white young people going and saying Black Lives Matter, you have to bear in mind that they, these white, young, wonderful people with all the best intentions, they are descendants of people who destroyed the self-esteem of others and at the expense of others, aggrandized their own self-esteem. So even the ones who now sympathize with the Black movement or the Black Lives Matter, there's an element of superiority. There's an element of condescension. There's an element that I'm better than you are, okay? And we are not looking at that. We are not looking at the epigenetic ramifications of the story. Now, scientifically speaking, if you take a few mice and you expose them to a very pleasant smell, they love it. And they're attracted to the smell. But then you take a group of mice and you expose them to the same smell and give them mild electrical shocks. For the next several generations, the descendants of the mice who got the electrical shocks, they'll be scared of that smell, okay? That's an epigenetic scientific fact that even our body harbors the memory of a story that happened 500 years ago. So while Black Lives Matter is a very important step, it's not going to solve the problem. The problem is what's the new story? What's the new story? And the old story is dead now. It's dying. We're seeing that in the demonstration. But what's the new story? And where does COVID-19 fit in? You know, COVID-19 is actually, uh, and I'd be politically incorrect right now, COVID-19 is a mutation of genetic material that has existed for millions of years ago. The coronavirus has existed for millions of years. Human beings have existed only 200,000 years. So, you know, as far as the planet is concerned, viruses, bacteria, fungi are the genetic information of the planet. And our genetic information, what we call the microbiome, is entangled with that genetic information. The genetic information of the planet works 
in cooperation. It's not racist. So you have 65% of your genes are the same as a banana. 80% of your genes are the same as a mouse. 98% of the genes are the same as a chimpanzee. We are entangled with all of life. And mutations occur when one species overtakes the ecosystem of existence. Then something happens. And of course, you know, this species has despoiled the planet. Our food is inflammatory, petroleum products, inflammation in the food, inflammation as a result of ethnic identity, racial identity, religious identity, political identity, national identity all false constructs because we have the same origins genetically we are entangled period and when the ecosystem is stressed which means the genetic information that creates life is stressed then mutations occur and mutations occur so that existence can repair itself life can repair itself which it is doing right now if you look outside the, my window you can see a clear sky if you look outside my window you can see now that the fish are returning to dead lakes. You can see that people are breathing in Hyderabad. You can see Himalayas can be seen from 500 miles ago. It's obvious that we can live in an oil-free economy. It's obvious that climate change possibly is reversible. So actually COVID-19 may not be an enemy. It may be a gift telling us that existence is not just human existence. Human existence is tied into all existence and existence by definition is life and life is entangled differentiation is not separation the only difference between you and a black person is the amount of pigment in their skin because of the weather and the sun and all of that and the geographical location so one species is not superior to another species by the way the the covid 19 has showed you that a little piece of dna little piece of genetic material can bring civilization to a halt, can bring civilization to a halt, can crash the markets, can trade, introduce to trade wars, cyber warfare, hacking, all of this, people going on the streets, violence, all of this is happening because the entanglement of our genetic story is being ignored. We come from the same source, we have the same genes, we have the same biological expression, and even the animals that we see, if they reflect us, we say they're like us, okay? And if they don't reflect us, we say, oh, that's a virus, or that's a bacterium. But without those viruses, bacterium, fungi, you wouldn't exist. So this is a moment for all of us to say, what's the new story? And the new story is not about human, importance it's about the importance of life it's mm. the importance of existence and if we realize that then we will be saved if we don't change our story we're headed for extinction oh that was a mic drop moment right there that's amen yeah i um i was having a conversation with my husband last night about how he said this is reminding him of 1968. That was the year I was born. I'm dating myself. And and I was thinking, we had, we've had protests before. We've had all this before. So why is it happening again? Can't we do it better, different this time? So I'm I'm hoping if if everybody reads your blue is not my blue and metahuman, then and just really absorbs it, then maybe that will happen. And I love, by the way, Deepak, the 30-day uh, process that you have at the end. So yes, if people are you. like, oh, this is too theoretical, it's like, okay, he breaks it down in 30 days. Like you could do something every day. Okay, so Aspen, back to you. There's a there's a passage that I feel like is, um, it, it haunts me. It haunts me in so many ways. It's a tiny little passage, but I'm going to read it. And then I'd love for you to, to unpack it for us. Um, it's on page 81. This is after this is after Hurricane Sandy and you come back, you and you and Justin come back from saving and doing all kinds of stuff, helping helping your professor and doing all kinds of great stuff. And you say, leaning closer, Justin told me, I love disaster. I didn't grasp his words, confused. I pulled away. You love people getting hurt. The knit 
maroon thrown blanket we'd been cuddled inside together fell down to the mattress, a shadowed red pool in the sudden space between us. He didn't attempt to defend himself. His vision remained fixed on the window, which was fogged over. You want people to feel pain, I pressed. It was as if he didn't want the hurricane to end. I couldn't understand him. No, no, that's not what I'm saying, his voice returned. I just want to be useful. So the hurricane reminded me of what Deepak was just saying about about COVID. It's like, it's politically incorrect to say, yay, pandemic, woohoo, this is great. But but we here's some some shades of blue that that reveal some of Justin's character that this is like the beginning of a little bit of dissonance between you two because you two it for the whole book it's just this Romeo Juliet like incredible love story and then all of a sudden Hurricane can Hurricane Sandy happens and there's this little fissure so what are you what are you reflecting on or what what do you see there um, now with all this distance between you and that time yeah well i mean i can see now like so much more clearly that what um justin was referring to was he loved to feel a part of something bigger than himself and he loved to feel he had a purpose and that and he he loved to feel like he knew how to serve people and how to be of service and how to contribute and in a time of disaster it becomes a lot clearer and people you know who are, who are strangers in you know new york buildings are now suddenly like on the same team and there's this camaraderie and there's this almost like like small town um family sort of feel and he loved that and he recognized that in you know in the kind of disorder of hurricane sandy and, and the kind of the the upending energy like he recognized that he wanted to have a a job that helped people and he wanted to do something that actually mattered not just move money around or you know made rich people richer or you know because he'd been working in finance and he realized that that was not something he could go back to so that was so at the time though it, i mean in hindsight it's it's easy to see because you've put some pieces together and again i don't want to reveal too many pieces of this puzzle but but in a way justin was doing something that i actually think is part of what deepak talks about like being able to see things from a different perspective even Buckminster Fuller and Barbara Marks Hubbard, there's this there, talk about how it's it it's it evolves us to look for what's right about something or what's good about something that might be obviously not good or destructive. It's so um I feel like this there's so many building blocks to what would make us metahuman. And part of it is to be able to have compassion for other people's perspective, but maybe also find the good in 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 disasters or even in a, a virus you know so i i love that what were you about to say aspen i could see oh yeah i mean off of what you just said like it reminds me of um you've told me the story of a friend of yours who um survived quarantine and was it iran oh um, yeah he went, went into the um into the quarantine an architect and came out an artist a painter and i feel like the, the time and space that we have with ourselves that we might not have had if it weren't for um, this pandemic is sort of like an opportunity that we don't want to waste. It's a gift to like get to spend so much time with yourself and or with your family uninterrupted by all the things that you thought you had to be doing before and it's an opportunity to create and to explore things that you never would have had time and space to to do if not for this so um i mean to me like this quarantine has been a time of of writing and reflection and meditation and taking long walks and not having to do anything i don't want to do <laughs> mm -hmm. 
And I loved what you said in your NPR interview that you just recently did in talking about your new book, Your Blue is Not My Blue, about how in your solitude while you were writing the book, well, I don't know that you knew you were writing the book Girl in the Woods when you were journaling while you were out there on the trail, but creativity was part of your um, your medicine for the loneliness or for the pain as a way to not deny it, but to express it and to explore it. So creativity is is a is a really big part of, I think, being meta-human and finding all the blue, <laughs> all the all the beauty and all the many shades of blue. So that's beautiful. And we have darker shades of blue where Deepak is. He's plugging in some light. That's good. Yeah, how is this? It's all such a metaphor. That's perfect. Beautiful, beautiful light. Okay. So Deepak, I, I want to say one thing that I that I feel in in being immersed in your book um, is there, I, and I wish I highlighted this. I highlighted a lot, but there's one. It seemed like it came at the beginning about how this invitation to be metahuman, to be beyond our ordinary way of being. I feel an exclamation mark coming from you. Like it doesn't feel like, oh, it's just an invitation. You could take it or leave it. It's fine. It's almost like you're saying, no, it's not fine. Jump on this. Like there's a mandate that we wake up, that we that we realize who we are. Am I just uh, imagining that? Or do you feel like, is there like a burning energy in here? I mean, to me, this feels burning. I feel like it's kicking well, it my is, butt. It, yeah, it is in the <laughs> sense because if you look at the world and you say, what am I looking at right now? Yeah. Step back. What are you looking at? You're looking at uh, mechanized debt. You're looking at uh, an unsustainable environment. You're looking at war and terrorism. You're looking at extinction of species. You're looking at extreme social injustice, extreme economic justice extreme racism, bigotry, prejudice, and unfortunately, you're looking at leaders all over the world who are gangsters. So given that combination, um, unless we are asleep, that's a prescription for extinction. The last extinction was 65 million years ago when a meteorite fell on Earth and dinosaurs were wiped out. And that happened in one hour, the entire life on this planet, which is predominantly these other species, got wiped out in one hour, which was the equivalent of a nuclear explosion. And now we have the capacity to do that 17 times over. And it's a human capacity to do that. And you need a few crazy people to do that. You know, anyone with a smartphone can figure out how to leak, cause a leak in a nuclear plant or cut off electricity or poison the food chain or interfere with pacemakers and respirators. There's a lot of that happening already. So we are headed for disaster unless we wake up and ask ourselves, who are we? Are we still you know, behaving like people in the Bronze Age, but with modern capacities? Or can we wake up to our genius, which has created all this science and technology, that we can now have this conversation. She's in Portugal, you're in M Miami, I'm in California. Look at the genius behind this. That is a story itself. If we can do that, why can't we take care of our stupid, narrow-minded, tribal, um, middle-aged, Bronze Age mentality with all this modern capacity? And if you don't do it, then we are headed for extinction. Stop reading books. You go hit the bar and get drunk. Yeah, Deepak wrote. Oh, um, Deepak wrote an article that I really loved about the distinction between like a welfare state and a well-being state. That I, I mean, I wonder if you could speak a little bit about that. It was. Yeah, the well-being is everything. It's a joyful, energetic body. It's a loving, compassionate heart. It's a clear mind. It's lightness of being. It's empathy, compassion, love in action. That's what well-being is. And well-being is related to everything that we aspire to. You know, your physical well-being, emotional well-being, social well-being. And uh, 
business well-being and ultimately societal well-being and then beyond that spiritual well-being and spiritual well-being just is not a very difficult concept it means to be self aware if you are self aware you are reflective if you ask yourself who am i what do i want what's my story am i happy with my story or not what's my future story what's my purpose what am i grateful for and things kind of gel and you see a vision and that's what transformation is it's shared vision these days it's spiritual and emotional bonding it's complementing each other's strength and asking ourselves do we want to live like this scared all the time you know right now everybody is scared the black people are scared but so are the white people scared who's who's not scared okay they're all scared because they don't have they're not in touch with their soul so if you get in touch with your soul there's no need reason to be scared you're inseparably connected to the elements and forces of the cosmos that sustain existence and all you have to do is fall in step with that by getting in touch with your own self so i think this is an opportunity for humans to get together forget the governments forget the businesses forget the ideologies forget the religions say collectively together how can we create a more peaceful just sustainable healthier and joyful world and that requires our inner transformation our mind is part of the global mind our brain is part of the global brain we even have a new word for the global brain it's called the internet and we can we can rewire it through our collective participation so why aren't we doing it we need to create a critical mass for a more peaceful just sustainable healthier and joyful world and if these riots and if covid-19 a pandemic can move us in the direction then we will not have wasted this opportunity or otherwise as i said go to the bar and get drunk <laughs> i keep coming back to the saying um a crisis is a horrible thing to waste that's so it i hope we don't waste it okay so i'm not sure if other people are like me but in the past i've tended to to um either or things like um I'm reading MetaHuman and there's this wonderful netty questionnaire at the beginning. So um and it's basically so I invite everybody to first buy both of these books, Your Blue is Not My Blue and MetaHuman and I'm going to be doing this throughout this conversation. We're not anywhere near done by the way. But um in MetaHuman there is a there's a quiz if you want to kind of check into how meta human you are like there's a you can score you can rank yourself and it's very clever deepak to put this in here because it made me it made me realize in the places where i didn't score very well you know i was trying to be honest i could have lied and just said i am meta human 100% but no i scored i don't know once i got somewhere in the 60s somewhere and then i got 75 when i i took it when i was feeling a little better but it makes me wonder about the feeling quality versus the doing so one of the questions on this this test and it's on it's actually um on page 30 in the introduction it's it's um here's two questions number 19 feelings i this is something that i you experience either never rarely sometimes most of the time or all the time and and it's this the statement is feelings of gratitude and or open curiosity about all experiences okay so that might seem like a a benign question but so it's as if it implies if i was to be meta human with a capital m and h i would I would have feelings of gratitude and open curiosity about everything. That means everything. Yeah, that means that you would find meaning in every experience. Basically. Okay. So it doesn't necessarily mean like, yay, I'm happy and no, no, no matter what. No, you find what. meaning. You might find meaning. Great. And you question your story. Okay. Okay, well then I'm going to give myself a 5, not yeah. a 3. Oh. <laughs> okay, wait a second. All right. Now we're on a roll. Here's the next here's one more. a sense of flawlessness and beauty of everything and everyone just as they are wow i mean these these are simple statements but 
to me, this is now tattooed in my brain. This is what I aspire to, to really see this sense of beauty and so flawlessness. This particular question comes from a very profound insight mm -hmm. in the philosophical traditions of non-duality or what we call um, understanding of the self. And the statement that is made is when you see yourself in an object, let's see, I see myself present in this microphone. What does that mean? I give full awareness to this microphone and then I did establish a relationship with it. I put my awareness into it, but I also feel at the level of heart that I'm present as awareness in it. I fall in love with it. And when I do that, then every object is beautiful. You do that with a person, then you fall in love with the person. To see yourself in a person is what we call love. And to see yourself in an object is what we call beauty. And they're both connected. So beauty and love are the presence of your own being in every perception, because every perception is dependent on your presence. To, there's no perception if you're not present to it, right? You can hear the most beautiful music, but you're not present to it. It's noise in the background, right? But when you're present to it, it's gorgeous. And even if it's ugly sound, if you're totally present to it, and you ask yourself, what is my relationship with this sound? Because I'm experiencing it in me right now. What is my relationship? How can I embrace this experience? You'll see that everything you see has another perspective, another context, another story, another relationship. And you realize suddenly that the blue you are seeing is not the blue you're seeing now. Exactly. Um, the more you're talking, the more connected I'm seeing these two books. Aspen, you're, it, this is just such a, it's amazing to see the connection between MetaHuman and your blue is not my blue. So I'm feeling you buzzing, Aspen, but I'm wanting to, there's a scene in your book where, you, so part of one of the through lines in the book is the struggle that you have with your, with your, with your family. And it's like, it's kind of like what young people struggle to, the baby bird struggles to get out of this beautiful nest that their parents have built for them. And they just, they have to push against it in order to find the strength of their own wings. So this is you giving the most eloquent voice to this process. And then you have this awareness. I don't know if you want to talk about this or not, but it, it it's around you being on a walk with your mom and your dad and you having an aha about your ski coach back in high school that was uh, somebody that I would have a hard time finding beauty and gratitude <laughs> for <laughs> in every moment. He was somebody that I would like to, if I met him, I would have a hard time not using my karate on. Ah. So, but you have this great aha where you take something that was done to you that hurt you and you see it differently. Do you want to speak about that without giving too much away? Because I want people to read this themselves. Sure. Um, yeah, I think that ever since, you know, from when I was 17 to when I was like 25 or 24, I really, I blamed my parents for the lack of justice in the aftermath of um, something that I, you know, that I thought was wrong. Like, you know, my, my parents, they said, you know, well, you know, we'll fix this. Well, you know, this is wrong. We'll fix this. And, um, but there's a, there, there's a limit to what people can do. And like, there was really, they did what they could, but you know, what, what had happened had happened. And I kind of never, I didn't forgive them for that. I blamed them for not being all powerful, really. Um, <laughs> and I I think realizing that they really did everything they could do and and that, you know, my distress was their distress and that their um their hearts were a hundred percent with me, um I I could forgive them. And I think it just it took some maturing and some zooming out and some seeing that um, 
and some uh, kind of forgiving authority figures who you love and trust for not being all powerful <laughs> too. I think that was their only crime, not being all powerful. <laughs> oh, but it's such a, it's so powerful because you take us so deeply into what Deepak is talking about in MetaHuman about kind of the, I guess we could say there's the before and after there's the human with the small H that's just kind of blaming and shaming and limping along kind of like a zombie. And then there's the meta human that wakes up that is hashtag woke. And, and so you take us through that incrementally with, with poetry because you can't, I mean, Deepak, you talk about this, how you, you didn't just wake up and here you were with this consciousness. You talk about how, did you say the first 30 years of your life as you were a doctor and like you, you, you didn't, this didn't come necessarily automatically to you. You had to struggle your way into this yeah, awakening. It came from uh, observing suffering in my patients and as a doctor in myself, you know, uh, I couldn't help my patients, I couldn't help myself. And then I, you know, kind of delved into the whole idea of what is existence and realized that all suffering comes from uh, this hallucination of the separate self. Nobody is separate anyway. We're all entangled in relationship and context and meaning and story. Mm. And your story affects my story and my story affects everybody else's story. Well, that's We're empowering. <laughs> all of a sudden, I just felt that, like my story affects your story. Of wow. Course. We're entangled. I like yes. that. <laughs> that's exciting. I just need a moment. Okay, so we have a lot of questions that have been sent in. So I'm going to just kind of roll the dice here and see. Right. By the way, how much time do we have left? Because I have another. We have another five hours. Are you okay with that? Just kidding. Uh, we have we have 30 actually, minutes. I have, I have eternity, but um, I <laughs> have another appointment also. <laughs> Okay. Well, we could we could do the Q and A with Aspen, and we yeah, can do a few one or two with me, and then Aspen, will you take over? Sure. Okay. Okay. So let's see. Let's see if there's. I know we've got a lot of Aspen. Is, more important right now is Aspen's book. It's the new book. Um, no, Meta Human is a book that I mean, it, it just it uplifted me so much, and every. Every line is just profoundly true, and I, I recommend it to anyone who is interested in learning how to transcend their own suffering and to help help the world heal right now. So. I also highly recommend this, and Aspen, I, I so appreciate you sharing um, your friendship with Deepak here. And before Deepak, let's get, let's just, do you have like two minutes to just say yeah, yeah, yeah. a couple of quick things? Yes, please. So yeah. I just, for anybody who's curious, um, you know, Deepak Chopra and, and Aspen Mattis are both brilliant luminaries, but m mostly people wouldn't, wouldn't know that you have, um, that you're connected. Do you, what do you think of this Aspen Mattis, this, this young girl? I, I think she's a brilliant uh, writer, great thinker, very creative, and she knows how to write a good story, which is all, humanity is all about the story. Yeah. Right now we are seeing a uh, conflict in the world between two stories, basically. Right, and we, we need to write about it in order to, make right about it maybe yeah with a, with the story of separation versus the story of love so before we let you go deepak do you uh, i was gonna this might sound a little bit morbid but i'm gonna go for it this is this was this is what's coming through um so if god forbid we want you to be around forever and ever but if this was your last interview if this was your last opportunity to speak to the world and give them a message about how they can take this this notion of being metahuman and make it real for them. If you could encapsulate that, crystallize a message that could send people into into becoming metahuman now, what would how would you how would you express that? One sentence, love in action. Love without action is irrelevant. Action without love is meaningless. But when you have action and love, you can change the world. You can heal yourself. You can heal the world. 
Deepak Chopra, thank you so much for joining us in this conversation that will continue. You. We'll talk be about you behind your back, but his book is Metahuman you. Unleashing Your Infinite Potential. This is your 90th book, nine zero. <laughs> wow, and we're all entangled. We're entangled yes, with you. Are. All yes. right. Well, what a blessing so, to meet you. Thank you thank so much. Thank you so much, Kelly. Thank you, Aspen. All thank the best you. and we'll meet soon, okay? Thank you so much, Deepak. <laughs> yeah, somewhere in the entanglement, okay, in the matrix. Great, thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, so Aspen, let's Hi. talk about Deepak behind his back. He was cool, <laughs> huh? That was yeah. awesome. <laughs> How amazing, and that just says so much for you. I mean, he's no schlum, and he thinks you're the bomb. So it's like, it's a fact. It's an empirical fact that you are a genius because me oh, thinking you're a genius is one thing. What's that? He's love in action. He <laughs> is love in action. I'm so inspired. That was great. Okay. So there's, a, you've got a lot of fans, Miss Aspen Mattis. So let's see, we've got Geneva Boyer and she says, Aspen, I just finished. Your blue is not my blue today. Loved it. Capital letters. Question. It felt like your book told three stories of loss and innocence. Justin's, Justin's via fire. Oh, I got the chills. Yours via Justin disappearing and yours via your parents suddenly seeming impotent with the ski incident. Oof, chills. And it's a 90 degree day today and I've got chills. Great, Geneva, you're quite a writer yourself. So her question is, what role has innocence played overall in your life? And what does innocence mean to you? Mm. Ooh, that was that's, good, Geneva. That's a great question. I mean, I suppose that innocence is sort of like a state that we all strive to return to, and yet it's inherently temporary um, in its like purest, um, purest form, like we can't always discover something for the first time. We can only discover something for the first time once. But um, I think the the idea of innocence being um, lost, like you know, through like rape or through like trauma, um, is like. It's a, as Deepak was saying. It's it, it is really a story. Like um, I've come to see that like the the idea that because something happens to you that causes suffering um, happens doesn't mean that you don't need that that you can never um, experience that same pure pure emotion and pure. Um, love or pure trust again it's just you have to create a new story that enables that that love in action and that um that trust and that can be really challenging and that can require a lot of um introspection and also um bravery to trust again after something um something breaks your trust beautiful answer. You're making me think if, if Nietzsche were alive, he would say amen to that. So may I be so bold as to speak on behalf of Nietzsche. He talked about the three metamorphoses and how we start off as a camel taking on the conditioning of everybody and being a good little girl, good little boy. And then we become a, a lion that has to slay the dragon thou shalt. And that represents our rebellion and our anger and mm -hmm. our, I'm not going to take it anymore. And, uh, you know, we're going to, we're going to protest. We're going to fight this, but ultimately we come back to a baby. The final stage of the metamorphosis is a baby where we re regain our innocence, mm -hmm. but a wisdom, not, not innocent naivety, but that, that open heartedness. And I think your story so describes those three stages perfectly, like immaculately. Thank you. I think that's beautiful. That's really powerful because yeah, I think um, the like the metahuman, like enlightened being that Deepak is, is evoking and helping people to discover 
is really the is the innocent the wise baby the the person who loves without walls without right. you know without the um without the thoughts that prevent love and the stories that prevent love this is why your story in your book your blue is not my blue is so important because i don't think we can just jump to wise baby mm-hmm. we have to like the only way the only way out it really is through and you take us through poetically and emotionally and evocatively and you make I, th- I think you make the journey you ennoble the journey and you don't just you don't stay stuck in any one place it's like you keep moving you your introspection follows you throughout but I think it's 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 an important this is an important companion on the journey for all three stages in the Toltec work and you know that that I do and now we do together they talk about st- how you go from victim to empowered victim and then ultimately to empowered. And so you have to move through those stages. So let's see who else has a question for Aspen Mattis, best-selling author of your blue is not my blue. Although right now your blue is definitely my blue. Mm -hmm. I even have a blue little teacup here. Okay. So we've got Eliza. Eliza and she says hi Eliza you're it's Eliza your biggest fan hey I'm her biggest fan Eliza you're I know Eliza. Not my birth. <laughs> okay you inspired me in so many ways and your writings have changed me validated me and healed me from the loss of my son oh I'm so sorry your blue is not my blue gave me some insight toward my own marriage as well can you talk to us about what your next book might be about? Wow, Eliza. Oh my God. Great question. Okay. Eliza, thank you for being here. Um, that's thank you so much for asking that. Um, my next book is actually about so uh, okay, so it's about the death of, of a friend, my friend Tori, who passed away suddenly when she was 25 years old. Um, and she hadn't been sick and she just went to sleep and and never woke up and um in her honor her her boyfriend of two years um and I took a road trip to a place where we had all three been together and um called Pescadero, this little town in California. And so um her boyfriend and I drove to Pescadero and um and like shared our stories and memories of her and we basically never said goodbye and so two and a half years later we're still together and it's about our connection through Tori's Tori's death and um and our relationship and the emotions like the guilt that I felt you know being with him after so soon after Tori died and about, you know, basically like um, the magical woman she was and, and is and how we felt her presence in her, in her death. And um, it's called magic after life, after like two words, magic after life, a memoir of grief and wonder. And yeah, thank you for asking Eliza. (laughs) I'm so on the ride for that. And I'm I'm so grateful to have met you during that time and been privy to some of the Tory magic and the Tory as an angel and as a guide and who's been following you too. And she is, I don't want to say, I mean, I haven't read the book yet, but <laughs> but I know that that there is an honoring of Tory for anyone who's listening saying, Hey, what do you what do you mean? This, this book is a tribute to this beautiful soul who is with us right now. She's part of our entanglement and certainly your entanglement. Your entanglement is my entanglement. Okay, so let's see. All right, um, we've got some more. We've got lots more. We've got this one from Luke. Luke or no? From Luke and the Lovingtons. Oh, cool. Yay. Oh, my God. Everyone check out his... His um, video 
um, let us dream. It's amazing. It's on YouTube and Luke and the Let's see. He, Luke is saying in regards to humanity needing to create a new story, mm. is it a story that we already know, but just haven't been living it? Or is it something new, like a new story and we have never known a new idea? And if so, how do we find a new idea? Oh, that sounds like a great title for a song, Luke. Just saying. Well, that's a profound question. I feel like Deepak is better qualified to answer that. No, than you could, you've got this, Aspen. I mean, to me, I don't think it's a new story or a new idea or a new idea. I think it's just my like my hypothesis as to what, you know, the most healing and and uplifting story for humanity would be is that all human beings are equally real and all human lives are of equal value and all life is interconnected and inherently meaningful. And if we poison our oceans or our rivers, we're poisoning the bloodlines of our, of our planet. And if we kill off a species, we never know what impact that will have on all the remaining species and to to honor and conserve and preserve life in all its forms on our planet is our ticket to to thriving to surviving as a species but also um mm -hmm preserving life on earth. Like I think as Deepak was saying, what we're doing right now is not sustainable and that's just a fact. And so I think the story has to be honor life through loving action and honor life in all its forms because we're all interconnected and inexorably linked and to um to do anything else would be to you know to kill ourselves off it doesn't make sense yeah. right wow and i'm i'm thinking um in in deepak's book in his meta human book in the those 20 questions at the beginning the netty questionnaire i think if if everyone took that questionnaire and saw where they weren't scoring so high and just made that their personal curriculum to score higher in the places of being able to celebrate diversity and to to not harm i mean I, it's really a recipe for how to be and it's a it's a you know i mean i think that i'm doing pretty good but then i take a questionnaire like this and i'm like oh i got some work to do and and oh yay i now i know specifically where to work what my work is. So, so I think that's a wonderful, that's a, that's a wonderful tool. And I'm just thinking it's so, it's so wise and clever that the two of you have bonded you, Aspen, Mattis and Deepak Chopra, because it's like, I think part of what Luke's question was, is how do we, do we access a new idea? Is the, is the idea already here, but we haven't been living it or is it something else? And maybe, maybe it's both, but maybe part of how we access it is bringing together opposite ends of the spectrum, bringing together a male, female, younger, older, different nationalities, different life stories. You're more of a poetic writer. He's more of a scientist, like bringing, having these opposite thoughts that are still, that are thoughtful and moving towards the same direction. But I think something is, something can pop in this space. Yeah, I think like the role of, of stories in this evolution is to make more concrete and more relatable and more real the abstract concepts so that you can really um, see yourself in, in them and you can really see how they apply to your life and to your world so it's not so abstract and um, but both are so important. Like the philosophy that underlies the stories is is equally important so yeah yeah yin and yang i know it's it's like if they could be combined into one book 
it would be exactly right because the science is great because it validates and and gives proof to what you intuitively come to along your the story of your journey and it and it makes it human it makes it relatable and it i mean your story is going to live with me forever just the scene where you're on the walk with your parents or just that moment with the red fabric on the floor between you and justin you know those these poetic moments are so visceral um thank you so, yeah we need that so and then luke i think you should write a song called a new idea and see what comes through okay let's see let's see what other questions do we have um Aspen Mattis and D, uh, this is from Sarah Dunham. Oh yeah. <laughs> so Aspen Mattis and Dr. Chopra, such an amazing combination, like I said, of mm -hmm. wisdom and creativity. Did you find your wonderful book, Your Blue Is Not My Blue, is difficult to write? Oh, so Aspen, this is for you. Did you find writing, did you find your book, did you find your wonderful book, Your Blue Is Not My Blue, is difficult to write as your first gripping uh -huh. memoir girl in the woods and if you haven't read girl in the woods yet y'all gotta get it it's you gotta read it it's required for life <laughs> so. um that's it's a great question so no is the short answer it was, <laughs> the second book was much easier to to write than the first however um there were parts of it that i really felt um a little bit terrified thinking about strangers reading or my family and friends reading um like my my confessions which <gasps> i actually did write you know oh when i was 24 and the they're literally the same i didn't sh change a word um so i i never thought i would show them to anyone much less everyone and that I lost a little sleep over that, but it seems to be turning out okay. <laughs> okay, well, wait, 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 wait. We got to talk about that for just a <laughs> second because to me, in reading the book, and, you know, there might be a few details, but to me, it feels like you admitting this in the, in this section called Confessions, you writing about the things that were the most challenging like the most the aspects of you the aspects of your blue that are the hardest to embrace you wrote about it and and then without giving away too much things start to change for you so because i'm always on the hunt for tools techniques what's it going to take to turn the ship around when mm -hmm. we're suffering what's the quick way out of the suffering and it's not necessarily, I mean, you go, you go down the route of booze. You do, you do a lot of drinking to try to fix it. And if that fixed it, then this would be a very different book, but that doesn't fix it. That just prolonged the story. So we could talk about your sobriety as well, but the confessions was a turning point. So I just applaud you for your courage, by the way, for writing about that. And everyone, you got to know, you got to buy the book to find out her confessions or her, her other secrets <laughs> but it makes me love you a thousand times more so that must have so what was that like before writing the confessions and then after well yeah so i wrote the confessions during a time that was really like my rock bottom like you know like flaking on friends because i was drinking not you know not wanting to feel the pain of missing my husband and trying to numb it um, but always waking up with myself and um, always feeling kind of worse. Um, and so the confessions were really like everything that I didn't like about myself and how I was being. And also they were how I wished I could be like, um, and I mean, I don't have them right in front of me right now, but they're, yeah, I wish. I wished that um, I was, you know, more compassionate and less self-involved, and that I, you know, all these things that I thought, you know, made me a bad person. I just wrote them down totally honestly as they were, and I really felt like I was bad, but I desperately wanted to to be good, 
and I didn't see the way anything. And I just kind of told it like it was to myself. And um, after I wrote them, I, I never thought I would show anyone, but I did feel a lot better because I saw with so much clarity the work that I had to do. And it wasn't this, um, I, didn't, I no longer felt like I was inherently this way. It was more like this was how I had been being and I could choose to be another way. And so, yeah, the, the most, um, I mean, they became an incredible tool for me because they were real and they weren't, I wasn't lying to myself anymore. And it sounds, <clears throat> might sound simple, but it's kind of like, um, I think it was John Bradshaw years ago that said that if there was two doors you could walk through, one was labeled heaven, another one was labeled a conversation about heaven. Most people would walk into the room called a conversation about heaven. They mm. wouldn't, they wouldn't want to actually have a heavenly experience because it's, it's too confronting. It's like you, you catapulted yourself out of your pain by facing it, by giving words to it. And it seems like that would be the worst thing to do. Like, no, let's just shove it under the rug. Let's just pretend mm -hmm. it's not there. And you tried that because you're human. <laughs> I, I feel like if nothing, if nothing else, if people get nothing else out of this conversation, and I'm sure they're getting a ton out of the things, the wisdom that you and Deepak have shared, it's, it's, it's to to find a space to honor the things that you find dishonorable about yourself. And, and in so doing, I think love can then follow. I think what Deepak said at the very end was love in action. I think it's hard to love what is covered up and buried. So yeah. you got to kind of acknowledge it. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, these are your shadows and they live in the dark. And once you cast a light on them, they kind of fade. Right. They lose. So one, one of the techniques in MetaHuman um, on one of the 30 days that Deepak talks about is to put a, put a, a grain of salt or sand on your tongue and notice how jarring that taste is. And then notice how quickly it fades. And then notice that your memory can't recall how it tasted just moments before when it was so strong. So in a way, it's kind of like that, even with pain, if you acknowledge it, <clears throat> then it's it kind of starts to to dissolve. But um, I want to give a shout out to somebody who is who's texted me that let me know that they're watching. It's somebody who's in your book, um, Karina Ballerina. Oh, wow. <laughs> so she's one of the allies along Aspen's hero's journey who shows up in a magical way. Is there anything you want to say about the ballerina? who helps to make the ballerina's nest, which is what your apartment is. It's what you call it, the, the place yeah. with the turquoise walls. What do you want to say about Karina Ballerina? Well, <clears throat> I feel like, so Karina is a friend who I met in New York um, at like three o'clock in the morning or something at a cafe. And that night she slept over at my apartment and the next night she slept over at my apartment. And then the third night, my husband cleared out a, a cabinet in the, um, in the in the bathroom for her stuff mm -hmm. because he liked her so much too and she's so amazing and really um, she was like the friend who and is the friend who uplifts and and like I remember she said to me when you when you stop struggling you rediscover you are floating trust the water, it will carry you. And I've, I've repeated that in my mind about- Oh, say that again, say that again. <clears throat> when you stop struggling, you rediscover you are floating, trust the water, it will carry you. Karina Grandma, <laughs> not me. And that's in <laughs> your blue is not my blue. Yeah, yeah. and <clears throat> she, she was just so wise. And um, I feel like we were destined to connect and uplift each other and, and guide each other through some really hard times and um, and brighten each other's lives. And yeah. <laughs> Such a beautiful story because it's like you, I just love the way it's written. It's three o'clock in the morning, you're working on your book, you're you're writing and, and all of a sudden you hear this voice kind of 
coming from another table. You're not supposed to be eavesdropping. She's like, maybe I should leave New York. And you're like, no, <laughs> you encourage her. And it's the beginning yeah. of this gorgeous friendship. And now I'm friends with Karina. We just went for a walk last night. Oh, nice, Bucky. <laughs> I know, and we talked Fair about enough. you. You were with us in spirit. Uh -huh. So let's see, we've got some more questions. This is um, Courtney Greenhall. Courtney Greenhall. And she says, Aspen, you said that leading a purpose-driven life was part of what defined your relationship with Justin. What roles does that play now in your life? And she's got another question too, but we'll start with that one. Purpose-driven yeah. life. It's a great question. I, I mean, for me, I, I really feel like writing is my is my purpose. It is my calling. It's my way of like showing, like shining a light on on what is true in my experience, so that other people can see that they're not the only ones who have had that that thought or that experience or you know that there isn't something wrong with them and, you know, or there isn't, they're not in this alone. So I think for me, writing is my, my way of, of living as love in action because mm -hmm. my objective is to be of service to my readers and not just to entertain, like I hope that, that your blue is not my blue is entertaining, but really to, to uplift and to inspire and um, to affirm them exactly as they are and affirm their humanity. Um, the, I try to write the books that I needed to read <laughs> at the time when I was going through the experiences I'm writing about, so. Beautiful. So we only have a few minutes and um, <clears throat> I, and this might be too much to cram in, but I want to at least give a nod to this in girl in the woods. You, you really, um, you tell this story beautifully and there's kind of a call to action about supporting rain the, mm -hmm. and, and you become a spokesperson for rain mm -hmm. Um and I know that's still near and dear to your heart. Can you just say one, maybe just a drop about maybe what RAIN stands for? I know it's Rape, Incest. Uh, um, yeah, RAIN is the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network. And um, after I was I was raped on my second night of college, I called their anonymous free hotline and I told them what had happened. And they told me that you know, short shorts don't cause rape and alcohol doesn't cause rape and weed doesn't cause rape. Rapists cause rape and nothing causes rape other than rapists. And it sounds very obvious, but it wasn't obvious to me at the time. And it was really exactly what I needed to hear. And um, rape, oh, sorry, not rape, <laughs> rain <laughs> did um, an incredible service to me um, and was a, a support. And yeah, it's free and anonymous and um, I think just a great, great organization. And so um, I'm donating 5% of the profits of Girl in the Woods to, to Rain. And I was a spokesperson or I am a spokesperson for, for the nonprofit. Wonderful. And in this book, in Your Blue is Not My Blue, you don't, you're not, you know, it's not about a call to action necessarily, except if people are inspired to wake up and stop blaming and step out of victimhood and yeah. um and become not the missing person to themselves. Yeah. And one way that you've done that is you've taken a stand in an in your own way toward not drinking, not getting high, like being being mm -hmm. sober. Do you want to say something anything about because a lot of people that are creative, they think they need to be high, they need to be drunk in order to access that sublime floating state that Karina mentioned, you know, that, yeah. that flow state, but you live in that without any chemicals at all. And I think that is stunning as prolific as you are. So just say a word or two about that and then maybe we'll wrap. Well, I'm not, I'm not saying this as like, you know, to be prescriptive, like I think everyone yeah. is in their own journey and I'm not, you know, anti people drinking a, a glass of wine or thank god because i'm gonna have one right now <laughs> 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 you 
Yeah, I've just found that for me, I was using alcohol to numb myself and to avoid facing hard truths and realities that were uncomfortable and, and confronting. And when I stopped drinking, I like everything became much clearer and I became more productive and overall um, better to be around. <laughs> so I recommend it if, you, if you're using alcohol to numb yourself or self-medicate or avoid um, facing the, the pain because really the only way, it's a cliche, but the only way out is through and I really had to feel it to right. Heal it. right Ooh, to feel it to heal it and and you do and I think there's the whole notion of for those who are watching saying hey I don't want her to take that away from me then I'm I would say I it's she's not taking it away from me I just think the notion of not using that as as the as the as the blanket as the attempt to fix it yeah. um if you can go th to to address your your challenges lucidly and me as a dream worker it's like to wake up to be an awakened dreamer here and dream the the life that you are inspired that that can only be your life that you can create and aspen you have demonstrated to us how to turn the worst thing into the best thing because of your ability to create your ability to put words to your process and find find poetry and and at and deepak talks about the same thing i mean there's solutions here people there's we're not lacking for solutions <laughs> so is there any i mean, we're like right at the end do you have any last words if you could give everyone here one last like one last kiss one wish a kiss what would that be it would yeah it would be to honestly it would be to be brave like to do the thing that you that feels right to you even if it's not the thing that is is easy or the thing that you're told you should be doing to to pursue the the dream that lives in you um even if it's going to be really inconvenient <laughs> and yeah and it inspires people you have been not just a pebble in the pond but a boulder in the pond and so many ripples have gone out and you've inspired me i'm writing because of you and i know so many people are hearing this and and whether there there's transformation is happening now so that's that's what i'm so grateful to be a part of i Thank you so much from the bottom of my soul for your courage, your bravery, your poetry, and your beautiful, innocent baby energy. Nietzsche, Nietzsche's going to have to endorse your next book. I'll channel <laughs> Nietzsche's endorsement. <laughs> that will be on the next one. But thank you, Aspen Mattis. Let's, and let's bring back Christina from Books and Books. And again, everyone, get your copy of Aspen Mattis's Your Blue is Not My Blue. And you can buy it right down here at the bottom of the screen. And you can also get Meta Human, Deepak Chopra's book, at Books and Books. Go straight to Books and Books. Get all your books there. My books too. All books go to books and books. <laughs> all I can like say is wow. Oh my God. This was like, thank you both. This was mind blowing, beautiful, inspiring, love in action. I thank you both so much for being with us tonight. And of course, Deepak, wherever he is, also, we thank him. He's thank in the entanglement you. with all of us. Entanglement <laughs> with all of us. Thank you very much. And um, I hope that to see you again soon. Christina, thank you. And Kelly, thank you both so much. And Deepak, thank you wherever you are. <laughs> this was an incredible experience. And I feel really grateful to, for this to be the first Your Blue is Not My Blue event. It was magic. <laughs> Thank you for letting me be a part of it. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, Aspen. And be well, stay safe, stay healthy, and remember, love in action. Good night. Good night.